Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Amy Porterfield. Amy is an ex-corporate girl turned online marketing expert and CEO of a multi-million dollar business. During her corporate days, Amy worked with mega brands like Harley Davidson, as well as peak performance coach Tony Robbins. Through her best-selling courses and top-ranked marketing podcast, Online Marketing Made Easy, Amy has helped hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs. Amy's action-by-action action teaching style provides aspiring business owners with the tools they need to bypass the overwhelm and build a business that they love. But today we are going to get a bit personal with Amy and discuss parts of her journey that you may not be as familiar with. Amy gets vulnerable and we dive deep into her personal story, things that she is embarrassed to admit, and different forms of adversity that she has faced and overcome. This is a conversation that I thoroughly enjoyed and I think you will too. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Amy Porterfield to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Hey there, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you because you're somebody who I've always been admired by your work. I've always admired your work. I saw you speak a few years ago at the Rise Business Conference. I just said to myself, like, eventually I want to have you on. And I know one of the biggest things you talk about is marketing, is how to build a side hustle. But I think before you can market yourself, market a product, like build any kind of business, I think you have to believe in yourself and have a high level of self-worth. And there's a lot of people that are listening to this that potentially could be struggling with that and at the same time, they're also distracted, right? There's, they have so much going on and they might not have the time to dedicate you know, hours a day to rebuilding their self-esteem. So what would be three things you would tell somebody who's listening to this that is at a point in their life where they need to feel better about themselves, they're struggling with their self-worth, like how would you like, help them do that? I love this question because I've struggled with my self-worth for a very long time. I can think of a million different stories around that. And although I've been able to build this really successful business, it hasn't come with me just feeling confident every step of the way. And so when I think about rebuilding my self-worth, especially when you're so maxed out and so overwhelmed with life in general, I think the first thing is you gotta get clear on what you really want. And let me explain why what you want has to do with self-worth because Mel Robbins is a friend of mine, and she gave me this challenge to come up with five things that I want every single day for 30 days. And I thought it would be so easy peasy, but it actually wasn't. Once I was into day like five or six, coming up with new things that I wanted, it was so surface, and I, I couldn't like drop down into it. So I had to do a lot of journaling and a lot of work around that. But when you get clear about what you want, you start to ask yourself, how can I get there? And when you start to think about how can I get there, then you've gotta show up in a different way. And showing up in a different way means that you need to pull all the courage you've got, all the tools that you've learned along the way to be the kind of person that goes after what they want. And so right away, getting into action allows me to feel as though I am doing something that makes me feel worthy and capable. So starting with what do you really want? Do you wanna buy that house? Do you wanna get out of debt? Do you wanna quit that job? Do you wanna build your own business? Do you wanna lose weight? What do you want is a really great place to start. And don't just go for the surface stuff, actually push yourself. That's the first thing I would do. The second thing is you've heard it over and over and over again, but even though you've heard it, do you do it? I'm, I'm talking to the people that are listening right now. Are you doing this? You got to have a morning routine. I really do believe that morning routines are important. And I've heard other people say, oh, they're not that important. But for someone that's struggling with their self-worth and not feeling good about themselves, you wake up in the morning, you do 10 minutes of meditation, 10 minutes of journaling. You listen to a podcast that's going to fuel your brain and inspire you. If you've got these short, quick things that you do every morning, it gets you set up for the day so you could show up as your best self. I think your morning time is crucial. And then I think the third thing that I'd say is that you've got to surround yourself with people that genuinely are gonna shake you out of it when you need it. I have a few peers that know my business well, know my life well, and they can snap me out of it when I send them a call, SOS, I'm having a rough day. I deal with depression and anxiety pretty regularly, so I can wake up just not feeling my best self, but if I reach out to somebody and say, I need some words of wisdom, and I get them back quickly, having that accountability and having somebody who cares deeply means the the world to me. So surround yourself with a small group of people that will absolutely be there when you need them. I love it. Those are three great tips. And I think 
you know, what you just shared is, is so important. And you, and you mentioned that you've struggled a lot, you know, over the years with your own self-worth. Like what's been a time like recently within the last six months to a year or so where you've questioned your self-worth and you felt bad about yourself? Like what was going on in your life in that moment? And what are a few things that you actually like did that day, that week or whatever it was to help pull yourself out of that rut? So I have a book coming out called Two Weeks Notice, and it comes out early in 2023. And what I didn't know about when you write a book is you have to ask for a lot of favors. Can I get on your podcast? Can I do this? Will you help me do this? Will you send out this email? And I realized I hate asking for favors. I've built a business that is pretty self-sufficient. If I show up, I can do well. But with this book, I can't do it alone. And so I've had to ask a lot of favors and go well beyond my comfort zone and ask favors of people that are way, way, way bigger than me, have huge platforms, and I'm just going for it. I told myself, it's probably the only book I'm gonna write. Let's just go for it and do what I can. Well, I've gotten some no's along the way. And I won't name names or anything like that, but that kind of crushed me. And it instantly, I literally sent a message to a friend the other day that I got this no and I said, I just feel like I'm not important enough. I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like I worked for 14 years building this business I have today. And then it's like, I come crashing down because one person that I thought was so amazing said, no, I can't do this for you. And although that sounds silly when I say it out loud, in the moment, I just felt like I wasn't good enough. And so, one, I reached out to a friend, just like I said earlier. I knew she would like shake me back into, are you kidding? But also, I am a big believer in you just gotta feel what you need to feel in the moment and then move on. If I feel bad or sad, it's not gonna kill me, but I, I'm gonna feel it for a moment and then I'm gonna say, okay, me, what is the real story here? Stop telling yourself these stupid stories that are not true. Someone said no. Moving on, next, let's keep going. What's next is better. I live by that motto, what's next is better. So I've been feeling it a little with this book because it's so vulnerable and I have to ask for so many favors, but I gotta keep coming back to, I know my track record, I know what I'm capable of, and one person saying no is not gonna derail that. Thanks for opening up and sharing that. I can imagine it's got to be hard because I know you've spent a good bit of your life formulating like deep, meaningful relationships. And I would imagine have done favors for a lot of people through the years. And so when you get some of these no's, it really has to hurt a little bit. And I think this kind of parallels to something else I want to talk to you about. I went back into the archive of your podcast and I pulled up like episode, I think 213, where you talked about like 10 things you're most embarrassed about. And one of the things that you're most embarrassed about, you wrote, is that I'm going to read you. It says number six. I'm somewhat embarrassed by the fact that I am a fierce competitor. I want to be at the top of the charts on iTunes. I want to be the number one affiliate in launches that I do. I just want to win to the point that it's more my ego than anything else. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with that, with that said, like how has like this moment that you just brought up, like how has that reminded you of something that you said a few years ago? Yeah, I forgot that I had mentioned that. That was a really hard episode for me to record, but it's true, I do. I wanna be the top of the top. And so when someone that I know has a bigger audience than me, I know they make more money than me and they have much more notoriety than me, says no to me, I feel this big, like just tiny. And that competitive spirit of mine is like, I will tell you this, it's funny you should pair those together. After it happened, and it's happened a few times, so I've been doing this for a while in terms of um, getting this book up and running, and I need to stop and say, I've had so many beautiful yeses, so I need to be grateful. So many huge, big yeses, but there's just a few that kind of stung, and there was a little voice in me, it happened yesterday, it's happened a few times, that comes out and it, uh, that voice is, watch me, watch me. <laughs> And, and that I think is the healthy part of I'll show you, but not in like a mean way, just like, all right, Amy, here's a little bit more fuel for your fire to go do big things, make this book a huge success, wow people with the value in this book and let's go. So I think my competitive spirit with getting a no is I'll show you, but like, I really mean it in the healthiest way. Right. And I think that there is this healthy level of comparison. I think comparison can be really good, just like you just mentioned. But there's people that are listening to this that they struggle with the comparison trap. They struggle with opening up Instagram, opening up TikTok, opening up Facebook, whatever it is, and just scrolling and looking at what somebody else is doing and immediately comparing themselves to where they're at 
in their lives versus the person that they're like watching on social media? Like what have been some of your best practices to harness comparison so that it can be used in a way that is productive and not in a way that's destructive? Okay, so going back to adopting this motto of like, watch me, I'll show you. I think that little fierce side, you don't need to tell anybody that that's in you, but having that little bit of fierceness when things don't necessarily go your way is absolutely important. Like our mindset around our setbacks, you've gotta have some arsenal, an arsenal there to pull from, and that is one of mine. But I, many years ago, was listening to a podcast about Oprah's life, the queen, Oprah's life and how she became who she is today. And that podcast episode she talked about way back in the day on her talk show that I'm gonna date myself, but those around my age in my 40s will know, Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael, Geraldo, they were all really popular at the time. And she said, I didn't watch what they did, I didn't pay attention, and instead I ran my business like a horse runs a race. I put blinders on, I can't look left or right, I'm only looking forward and I'm staying in my lane. She said, my team and I, all we cared about is what we were doing, not what everybody else was doing. And when you look at her show, how unique it was, how different, how much she was the leader, I think there's something to be said about let's not worry about what everyone else is doing. If I did, I teach people how to create digital courses. And there are some competitors out there that are really big as well. And if I bought their product or read their sales page or got their emails, I would instantly, even though I have a multi-million dollar business and I'm 14 years in almost, I would look at someone's sales page and think, I don't measure up. That's better than mine. That's, that is human nature. So I don't do it. I do not indulge. You'll name people that I should know. I have no idea who they are because they're likely someone in my space doing something similar and I just don't think it's my business. And that has served me well. I run my business like a racehorse. And so like piggybacking off of that, off of this conversation on comparison, obviously you're one of the top marketing experts in the world. And for a few years, like you weren't on TikTok and TikTok has been like probably the most viral platform to be on in order for you to grow. Like there's still a lot of organic growth, they say, on a platform like TikTok. I know you're on it now, but explain like why you weren't on it for those few years. Like what was, what were you feeling like inside when you were seeing some of your friends go viral on TikTok and grow this massive platform that was helping their business? And then what inspired you to go back on TikTok? Well, I wasn't on TikTok in the beginning, not because I was afraid of it or anything like that, but because I only have so much bandwidth and I really do not want a bunch of spinning plates in the air. And so I decided, I made the decision to focus on some other things rather than adding on a new platform. Initially, that was it. And then when the platform started to get even more popular, all I saw was people dancing on TikTok. And I'm not that girl. I'm not like naturally funny in my business. I do not like to dance on camera. I don't even like to be on camera, period, but it's a necessary evil, so here I am every single day now. But the dancing part, I'm like, I'm not gonna do it. And I just know from building this business for so many years, I've done many things early on that were not good for my personality, were not a good fit, but I did it anyway, and I regretted it, and I was frustrated. So I thought, I'm not doing TikTok just because everybody else is doing it. But then I started paying attention. I got on the app, got super addicted. I, I think it's an amazing platform. And I watched some people that were more my style doing it, talking head, adding value, not being super silly the whole time. And I loved it and I love what they're doing. So I thought, well, I'm just gonna be me. So I have just been me on this platform. It is a very slow growth. And let me tell you a quick story. So my husband is Hobie, his name is Hobie, and he's a retired firefighter, blue collar to the bone. He doesn't know anything about this world that I work in. And one day I decided to do one fun video with Hobie where I was basically talking about how sexy his beard is. And so it was just quick little clips about Hobie and his beard and me loving it. So. We put it on Instagram and it has over 35 million views. 
And then we put it on TikTok, and I think it's like at 1.7 million views now. And I'm so angry about it because I have made thousands of videos in my life helping people change their businesses, adding value. My husband shows up on the app, there's one silly video, millions of views. And I, I look at him, he doesn't even have Instagram or TikTok. And I look at him and he's like, you're welcome. Like, okay, simmer down. So it's just so funny that I do one funny, funny video and it actually goes viral, but I'm just there for the people that I can help. And I gotta put my ego aside and just know that what I'm doing, I know can help change lives. I'm just gonna keep showing up for it. It's always the videos that you put like hardly any effort into and you're like, there's nobody's gonna watch this. This is stupid that goes like crazy viral. And then it's the videos that you put so much work into and you're like, this is really gonna help so many people that you're like, oh, why doesn't it have more views? I think it's a fun, it's funny how social media plays those tricks on us. And, and speaking of your husband, I know he's your best friend and he's like your rock in your world. And I know growing up, your relationship with your dad wasn't necessarily ideal. Maybe speak to that for a second, what it was like growing up with him and then maybe how you like healed that relationship with your dad and some of the things that maybe you and Hobie have had to do to be able to have a healthy marriage. No one's ever asked me this question before. So yeah, I grew up with a dad that was just really, really strict. Funny enough, he also was a firefighter, so there's a, there's a theme there. But my dad is the kind of dad, you never quit, you never stop, you never give up. You work a hundred and million percent to show up. If you're on time, you're late. Like it was intense. Now, I one million percent credit my dad to my hard work ethic. I work very hard and I know that came from my dad. And I take things very seriously, I know that's my dad. However, he was so hard on me that I can't help but think that when I'm beating myself up, when I'm hard on myself, when it's never good enough, I know where I got that. It, I got it honest, definitely, and I got it from my dad. And so when Hobie came along, he is very alpha male, like my dad, blue collar, like my dad, but he's also incredibly sensitive and he looks at our marriage as equal. My dad did not look at his marriage with my mom as equal. He was the boss, he called the shots, that's the end of the day. Hobie would never, nor would he even try to do something like that. So he's really aware of my sensitivities and maybe just a little trauma around how I was raised and he takes it really seriously. And what we do when we come up against anything that's hard is we just talk it out. Hobie, way before I met him, was in AA. And so he he did a lot of work in therapy on himself and it shows up in our relationship. He works really hard to be a good husband and I feel very fortunate about that. So I think the communication changed everything for us. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, I, I know it's not easy to talk about things like this and congrats to him on his recovery. Like that's amazing. And it's, it's really great. Over 20 years. So it's it's been a long time. And communication is everything, right? Like, just like you said, and there's people that struggle with forgiving their parent and that ends up carrying over with them into their adulthood and it impacts their careers, impacts their adult relationships, impacts themselves, impacts their health. Like, what advice would you have if somebody's listening to this and they're just holding on to a lot of resentment or shame about the way they grew up with their parents and it's like impacting them professionally or personally in a negative way? I really am a big proponent of therapy. I feel like I can't even imagine where I'd be without it. I've done EMDR therapy. I've had just a traditional therapist. I've done coaching. I've done a lot of work on myself and I really want to invite anyone who's struggling and just hasn't ever tried that or maybe he's tried it and it didn't work, find somebody else. I've gone through many, many therapists. But I gotta tell you, I really struggled last year. I, somehow or another, that the depression I talked about it came kind of roaring its head last year. I had moved from California to Nashville. I was really out of sorts. I wasn't sure if that was the right move for us, and I, I struggled. So I went to this place called Onsite. It's here in Nashville. Yep, or yep. Miles Adcox. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Miles, and I went there for a week, and you have to turn in your computer and your phone. I was embarrassed to say, I don't think I've been without my phone since the day I got it when iPhones came on the scene. So handing in that, not being able to talk to Hobie or anyone was wild. It was life-changing though, and I'm so very glad I did it. And it was very much out of my comfort zone. 
but I care deeply about the relationships in my personal life and my business. And I knew both of them were rocky at the time and I had to do something. So I was very scared, it was very uncomfortable, but the advice I'd give is let's try something new because what you're doing is not working. So I think it's incredibly important to take care of yourself. Amen to that. And this brings me to like the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. And it's with regards to like self-help and working on yourself and being committed to getting better. And you've been in this space for a long time. You've been in the self-help and personal development space for, I don't know what, 15, 20 years probably. And I think that there's a lot of people, they go to events, they go to seminars, they might read your forthcoming book and they just read it. And then maybe a year later, like nothing changes in their lives, right? And you see this a lot where they just bounce from program to program to program, book to book to book. Like what advice do you have for somebody to make the most of their investment in the self-help space, whether they're, they're listening to a podcast, whether they're reading a book, whether they're going to an event, like how can somebody make the most of their experience? One thing I learned early on is that action creates clarity. And if you're really confused, overwhelmed, stressed, and you don't have that focus or clarity, it's likely because you are not taking consistent, imperfect action. I'm not looking for anything perfect, but imperfect action. So for me, you're right. I've been listening, you know, I work for Tony Robbins, but I listened and followed Tony Robbins before I worked with him. And I'm always having some kind of self-development podcast or audiobook in my ear. And I'm constantly doing coaching or therapy or whatever I need to do. But I'm not just listening, I'm actually doing. I'm writing down, okay, here's three things that I need to take from this and actually do. So sitting on the couch or watching the show or listening is absolutely not enough. Become a student, the type of student that says, okay, what am I going to do with this information before you consume something else? Sometimes we gotta stop consuming and start doing. And I think that works for all areas of our life, but especially with self-help. If you've been in it, you've listened to it, you've watched it, you've attended, but nothing's changing, it's likely because you're not doing the work that you're learning. So you gotta get into action. Right. That's the hard part because it's easy to get addicted to self-help because it makes you feel good, right? You read a book, like you feel great. You listen to a podcast, you feel great. You go to an event, you're all fired up. And sometimes I said a few seconds ago, people just bounce from one thing to the next and just keep getting that high, keep getting that high and so on and so forth. Speaking of your departure from working for Tony Robbins, I know that's a big part of your story. And obviously you're a fierce competitor. Like you said, when you left there, was there ever this drive to build something bigger than Tony Robbins? Absolutely not. <laughs> so I've talked about this before that until probably recently, I never set really big goals, probably because I was afraid that I wouldn't meet them. So that's a whole other thing I've probably gone to therapy for, but never in my wildest dreams. Quite honestly, when I left my nine to five job, my only goal was I want to make as much money as I'm making right now. Like that was my first goal. And it wasn't so much about money or building an empire or being huge. I wanted freedom. I talk about this in my book a lot. I wanted to work when I wanted, where I wanted, how I wanted. I didn't want to hit the glass ceiling. If I chose to make more money, I wanted that opportunity, but I wanted freedom more than anything. I didn't want to be on someone else's time or someone else's dime. And so that was it for me. So I never really felt that way. But now like what I've created and the circles I'm in, and sometimes when those circles kind of overlap with Tony or what he's doing, I sit back for a second and I think, not in a million years did I think that I'd be having this kind of conversation or be on this show or be doing that. So it is kind of surreal, but yeah, never was my dream. Yeah, because now you're like in similar circles to Tony, it's right? Wild, so wild. It's super inspiring. I want to talk about what you just said about goal setting, how you said you never used to believe that you could achieve these big goals. What has your relationship been like with goal setting? Like, why do you feel that you had this imposter syndrome, I guess, if you will, with regards to chasing some of these dreams that you wanted to chase. And then what was the turning point for you where you were able to like look within and say that you deserve to chase after these things? Mm, I love that question. I always felt, you know, because of my upbringing and some struggles I had with my dad, I definitely have always struggled with, am I good enough? Do I deserve it? I remember my very first launch where it was a really big success, and I made $30,000 in like seven days. And that was, it felt like I made a billion dollars. That was a lot of money. And I remember thinking that must've been a fluke. 
I can't do that again, and something good just happened, so something bad is likely going to happen. This is embarrassing to say, and I don't do this anymore, but for a long time, I just thought I don't deserve it, so it's gonna be taken away or something's gonna happen. And so I had to really work through that. And one of the things that I think for me, what I, I really, so I would set small goals because if I don't reach those huge goals, I'd feel bad. I'd feel like I wasn't good enough. So let's just set some really realistic small goals. And if I pass it, great, I'm gonna feel amazing. And I've been very fortunate on my journey as an entrepreneur because I've done amazing big things with kind of small goals. But I don't know how that worked out, but I got lucky. I do not suggest it. But let me tell you the turning point. I read a book called The Gap in the Gain. Have you read that? Dan Sullivan, Benjamin Hardy, it is excellent. And the whole premise of the book is that instead of saying, let's say if I wanted to make a million dollars in a launch and I made 800,000, what I've done for years and years and years is obsessed about that $200,000 I missed. The gap is $200,000. What did I do wrong? What could I do different? Let's go for it. I'm not happy till I make it. Let's go. And unfortunately, that has worked for me, but in a way that's really hard. Like talk about being in hustle mentality. I was there for many, many years. What I've learned and what I've changed now is I focus on the gain. So if I wanna make a million dollars and I just made 800K, I will acknowledge, all right, I'm 200K off. What could I do different? What didn't work there? That's a short period of time. Then I change my focus and I say, look what I just did. I went from zero to $800,000 in a 10 day launch. We're gonna celebrate that all day long. And I recently did a really big launch for my program, Digital Course Academy in September. And on day one, before we made a penny, I was absolutely at peace. I knew what Ever's going to happen, I'm gonna feel proud at the end of these 10 days. And that was something I'd never experienced before. So unfortunately, it's taken me a long time. I'm a slow learner, but I get there. And it was the most enjoyable launch ever, and we hit our goal, but I came into it with a very different mindset, changed everything for me. So the gap in the gain. The gap in the gain, I'll have to uh, check that book out. It sounds very fascinating. And you know what you just said about perspective when it comes to achieving goals is, is so important, especially for people who are on this long journey, whether it's business, whether it's a health transformation, whether they're trying to heal a relationship, is you have to focus on how far you've come and not how far you have to go. You have to celebrate these small wins. For somebody who's listening to this that, that maybe they want to set like a big goal, maybe it is like losing a significant amount of weight, maybe it is like running a marathon or you know saving their marriage, like whatever it is, other than like perspective, like what are a few keys that you think are, are really important for people to pay attention to so that they can set and achieve these goals? So what are some things that they need to really pay attention to as they're setting these really big goals? Yeah. What are some things that they need to do? Like, is it discipline? Is it like doing like certain things every single day? Like what are some things that people can do throughout the process to make sure that they can stay as focused as they can at achieving these goals? So one of the things that has helped me immensely is that when I put, set a goal, I do milestones. We do this in my business. I've done this in my personal life. So let's say someone who has lost a lot of weight. And so let's say if I want to lose 80 pounds, I had to set these milestones, almost really achievable milestones throughout the entire thing. And one thing that I struggle with, but have really focused on is celebrating each of the milestones, actually acknowledging that something great just happened more than just a minute. And so the milestones have helped me immensely, but I look at those milestones every single week. So I think checking into either what the goal is or the milestone you're going for is really important because if you set goals and then it's out of sight, out of mind, at the end of the year, you're either gonna surprise yourself that you hit them or you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I forgot I even set that goal. So actually seeing them on a post-it note makes a really big difference. So that was one for me. Also, I used to set tons of goals. Like I'd have 15 goals on January 1. I love January 1, I love new beginnings, I love starting over. And so I'd set all these crazy goals and it was so overwhelming that I didn't even want to think about them because they made me so nervous. Now I set very few goals, but really meaningful, like hit me in the soul kind of goals. And that has made a big difference for me as well. And I think that along the same lines of setting and achieving goals, it's choosing to do something different. I want to read a post of yours that says, the biggest moments of growth are the ones where I've decided to do something different. 
My business and my life in general will be nowhere near where they are today without these leaps of faith, whether they've been really big or very small. What is one like blessing professionally that's come from taking a leap and then one blessing personally that's come from taking a leap? Okay, so when I say do something different, I always say this, DSD. I live by this motto, a DSD, do something different. I actually learned that from my husband's ex-wife who set us up on our first date. It's a story for another time, but she's really a big part of our lives and she teaches her clients to DSD. So do something different. And I think that this book that I've written is the one professionally. So I never, ever thought I would write a book. I would think about it and be like, no, 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 I'm not gonna do it. And I realized all the reasons why I was afraid to do it. And then I thought, okay, we're gonna move past that. We're gonna do it. We're gonna get it out there. And when I started shopping it around, I was so afraid, what if I don't even get a book deal? Like I, all these fears started coming up. And I realized that writing a book means you literally have to put yourself out there in, to me, the biggest way I've ever done. I tell stories I didn't necessarily wanna tell in that book. I have to ask for favors, like I mentioned, like it is everything out of my comfort zone. So I think that would probably be a really big one for me professionally. But for personally, I think moving to Nashville has been one of those DSDs that I'm really proud of and glad we did. I love California. I was born and raised in Southern California, went to college in Santa Barbara, like Southern California, I'm there. But Hobie really wanted to shake things up and do something different. And I was very afraid to do that because I don't know anything about anywhere but Southern Cal. But we did it and I struggled for a year and then I came out of it. And looking around now, the friends we have, the life we live, we're more social here. We got a lake house right outside of Nashville. My whole life is different and better. But I had to weather the storm. So I guess a lot of things for me, they don't come easy and they sure as heck aren't with many, many challenges along the way. But I always seem to get to that other side that I'm like, okay, that was worth it. So for those that are listening that they're in the messy middle, it's not working out right now, please just hang on, hang on a little bit tighter. I promise you there's something on the other side that you're going to really love, but that messy middle is rough. Messy middle is rough. And you've had many experiences with, with starting over and they've, they've changed your life. You've talked about, you know, leaving your job, working for Tony Robbins. You talked about recently moving from California to Nashville. And there's people that might be listening to this, that maybe they're in a time in their life where they, they might need to start over in their business. They might need to start over personally in a relationship or whatever the case may be like looking back like you've learned so much i'm sure throughout the, throughout the course of your life like if you were to make a transition let's just say that you were like leaving working for tony robbins and, and knowing what you know now like what are a few things that you would tell yourself in that moment to make sure that you set yourself up for success Ooh, what would i tell myself now i think the first thing i would tell myself is not every decision is set in stone. It's not as important as I thought it was. I thought everything coming to me when I first left my nine to five job and started my own business, everything mattered. So I was worried and nervous at every turn. The business I started when I first left my corporate job and the business I have today looks dramatically different. And I think that's very normal. I wish I would have just gave myself grace, let it happen to see where the chips may fall. I was so wound so tight that I didn't get to enjoy that process. So I tell myself to chill out just a little bit. It's going to be fine. I think the other thing that I wish I learned early on, but unfortunately in my 40s is where I had to learn it, I can't make everybody happy. And I really want to, even still to this day, I do. I've given up on it, but still there's a little piece of that's like, it would sure be nice if I could. Not everyone's going to like me. I'm not going to be, everyone's cup of tea. And in the beginning, I really wanted that. And it made it so that I showed up not as my true self. I was being somebody else. I was Whatever you want me to be, I will be kind of thing. And I struggled with that. I didn't even know who I was for a little while. So I've had some experiences in my business. I talk about this in the book where I had a partner and we severed ways. And that was so scary I didn't even recognize who I was after that because I was everything he wanted me to be when we were a partner. And so afterwards, I felt like a shell of myself. So I've lost myself a few times along the way, but now I'm at a place that I just know I'm not for everybody, so I'm just gonna have to be who I am. And geez, that is freeing. I've been looking for freedom this whole time from a corporate job. I think freedom from trying to please everyone is even more important than that. 
I want to talk about what you just said, where you felt like you lost yourself because you were conforming yourself to who this business partner of yours wanted you to be. And there's people that they do that in relationships, they do that in business, where they lose their sense of purpose, they lose their identity trying to please other people in their lives. What were some of the things that helped you like rediscover yourself internally of you know, what Amy actually wanted in her life, who she truly was at her core. Like, what are some things that you did to help you like on that journey of rediscovery? The first thing is I had to stop lying to myself. I would not even utter the words, I'm not happy in this partnership. I wouldn't even say it out loud. I had this situation where I was talking to a good girlfriend on a walk and I just said something along the lines of struggling with the partnership, kind of like not really saying it, but saying it. And she said, let's talk about that partnership of yours. Like, nope, we're not gonna talk about it. Like I was so shut down because I was so afraid to admit that I was very unhappy. And so once she kind of pushed me and it took a few weeks, but I finally said, I want out of this partnership, it like broke things open for me. So I had to get honest with myself. And I think it's very easy to lie to ourselves when we don't wanna face something. So that number one was a big one. Number two, I had to start to believe that no one was going to come and save me. It was literally up to me, not even my sweet husband. Like I had to own what I wanted, taking it back to the very beginning of this conversation, what do you want? And for me, I did not want a partner. I also wanted to change how I was doing products in my business, what I was offering. I didn't like the direction we were going. The minute that partnership ended, I went from a $5 million business to a $16.5 million business. And I share that not to brag, but to say, that takes a very different person to go from five to 16. And what happened in between is I literally stopped lying to myself. I got clear on what I wanted. And then I became uncomfortable every single day. I got up on stages that I was nervous to get on. I asked to be on podcasts that freaked me out. And I got more on video, which is something I've always struggled with my weight. So I've always been very self-conscious of video, but I'm like, screw it. I want this bad enough. We're doing it. So I had to show up as a much better version of myself than I was before. And it all comes down to us playing small and I was tired of it. So I had to stop playing small. So that's what my journey looked like for me. And honesty is the best policy, right? Just being able to be honest with yourself and admitting that you're not happy with yourself, whether it's in something in business or something personally, and then really like doing the work and getting clear on what it is that you want in life so that you know, you can take the right action steps to get there. Kind of like what we talked about at the beginning of our conversation. Who's been somebody in the self-help space that has been by your side, like thick and thin, like somebody that you've gone to during some of these times that has been a super solid friend to you throughout the years? So I've got two, Jenna Kutcher and Jasmine Starr. So people that maybe others would know, they're on speed dial. I talk to them every single day. And it has been so incredibly valuable in terms of knowing I'm not alone. Because entrepreneurship can be very, very lonely if you let it. And here's the little thing I've learned with that. I can't just hope that Jasmine and, and Jenna will send me good vibes and send me nice messages and pump me up. I literally have to be there for them. And this week, one of the girls had a really, really rough week to the point that she never cries. And there's messages she's sending me and she's sobbing. And I realized this is what true, true friendship looks like when we can absolutely just come unraveled and then in the next breath say, I'm gonna be okay, I'm gonna be okay. So I really cherish those relationships. That's amazing. It's always good to have solid people in your corner that are on the same path as you so that they can not only just remind you of why you're doing what you do, but they're able to, to hold you accountable and kind of check you when you're not doing your best. And then also, it's just easy to talk to people like that when they're having going through hard times. And it makes you realize like, man, like I don't have it that bad. Or I have so much gratitude for where I'm at on my journey because of what some other people are going through. And it just makes the, the process and the journey that much better. I want to talk about the side hustle because there's a lot of people that have started a side hustle that have succeeded and had dramatic success. And there's a lot of other people that start a side hustle and they don't. What's the blueprint? If somebody's listening to this and they're just looking, they're just trying to figure out like, A, should I start a side hustle? And B, like, what do I do? Like, what are some of the first few steps somebody can take to do that? I think the 
first step when you're thinking about a side hustle is to get really clear on where you would love to add value. Because some people will start a business or a side hustle just based on something they're good at that they kind of dread teaching, talking about it, sharing or whatever it might be. But they're like, I need to make money and I'm good at this so I'm just going to do it. And that is like a recipe for disaster and why most side hustles won't actually work out because the person doesn't love what they're doing. And another thing, so you wanna get really clear on what, how could I add value and what would actually bring me joy? The other thing is in the beginning, a side hustle the, the, by definition is that you're already making money in a different area, like a nine to five job. So if you're already making money in your nine to five job, give yourself a little space to get the side hustle up and running, meaning don't expect for it to make hundreds of thousands of dollars right out of the gate. Don't even expect it to make thousands of dollars right out of the gate. It might, but if you lead with, I wanna make this much money, you are definitely going to struggle. My least favorite question I get, but unfortunately I get it all the time. Amy, how fast can I make money with this side hustle? I hate it because I think you are focusing on the wrong thing. How quickly can you add value to someone else's life? Why don't you ask that question first? Because if you're adding value, you are moving forward. You will figure out the money game. Absolutely. And I love money and I love making money, but I just see it happen too many times when it's like that desperation and never turns out to be what you want it to be. But remember, you usually are making money somewhere else. Bank on that. Allow yourself to have a little grace with the side hustle. Mm. Give yourself some grace and make sure that you're not starting something new without having like a, a landing pad and having some income to come in first. And you know what you said about people asking you the question, like, how long is it going to take for me to make X amount of money? They want everything overnight. I think unfortunately, there's been a few like lies in the personal development world where there's been these programs sold that were like, all right, in 30 days, you'll make like 10, you'll be able to make 10 grand, 30 days, you'll be able to make 100 grand or whatever. What are some of the misconceptions that you've seen throughout the years as far as like building a side hustle that you think? people have begun to believe that just aren't true. I mean, right there, what you just said, like promising a dollar amount, I think you can get a side hustle up and running quickly, meaning put the things in place, but the actual how much money can you make, be really careful when people are promising that. They have no idea of your circumstance, what you're selling, your ability to sell, like there's so many different factors. Absolutely doable, but yeah, I get really gun shy on putting a dollar amount to that. I think another thing is that like, it's so easy. It's, it's no big deal. Just throw it together. Just put a few things here and there and just go. I'm a planner. I like a step-by-step -step guide. And so I always say, let's just slow down a little bit because I teach people how to create a side hustle that becomes a full-time thing. My book is all about quit your nine to five job and start an online business, not even a side hustle. But I talk about side hustles in the beginning because it's a nice launching pad to eventually doing the whole shebang where you become become your own boss completely. But I think thinking that it's gonna be easy, no big deal, I'm just gonna throw a few things together, I think you're more important than that. I think I think putting a plan together and really figuring out what it is you want and how you are gonna get there is very, very important. And then the last thing is, I don't think it's easy to build an audience. I don't think that's gonna happen overnight. And so anyone promising that, you don't need an audience at all, blows my mind, because I'm thinking, who do you think you're selling to? And then the other thing is thinking that you can grow an email list to a couple hundred thousand very easily. No, that takes time as well. But what I learned since I was really young is anything worth doing right is likely gonna take some time, effort, and energy. Let's just treat your side hustle just like anything else important in your life. Such great advice. I mean, what I found in my journey with entrepreneurship, and this could be completely different than yours, it's like it's like one day you think you have everything figured out, and then the next day you're like, gosh, it's not working. The next it's like this. Did you ever read The Entrepreneur Roller Coaster by Darren Hardy? No, but maybe I should because it sounds perfect. It's <laughs> spot on, with, at least in my experience with, with entrepreneurship. And I wouldn't change it for the world because of all the benefits that comes with it and the relationships I've been able to build throughout the process. But I want to dive in a little bit more into like the side hustle, you know, building an online business because I think people are interested in this. So let's just say that somebody's identified that they want to do this thing. They found something that they're good at, they like doing, and they want to start taking the next steps in order to build that thing. Like how can somebody start to do that? Okay, so two things you gotta think about. Number one is who are you going to sell to? Number two, 
what are you going to sell? So the first one talking about building an audience is not going to happen overnight, but the best time to start an email list and grow your audience was yesterday. So the best next time is absolutely today. So that's the first thing I want you to focus on. Sure. You can use social media, start growing your Instagram, your TikTok, whatever it might be. But the more important asset of a long-term sustainable business is an email list. And I can tell you that an email list will convert more than four times better than any social media post when that email list is engaged and nurtured. So don't build your side hustle or your full-time thing on rented ground, which is social media. That algorithm can change like that and your whole business could go away. So use social media to grow your email list, but bank on the email list. That's the first thing I would do. Learn how to grow an email list. Change everything for you. And then the second thing is, Figure out what you're going to offer and just keep it simple in the beginning. Whether you do a mini digital course, you want to do a simple membership, a mastermind, a physical product, some kind of audio training, whatever it might be. How are you going to package that offer that you want to put out there and figure out like, what is it going to be and how much am I going to charge? And let's start getting something out there. I think once you have a small audience, Floating out offers and seeing what people want is really important. So waiting a year to sell is not necessary. You can start selling pretty quickly, but we first got to focus on that audience. Yeah. Building the audience is so important. And it's something that I've done like backwards, like the way you said not to do it, where I focused on building my email list like last and I'm learning now that the importance of it. So if somebody like wants to begin to build their email list, let's just say somebody is completely new to this. How can somebody begin to start? Like, what do they need to do that? Like, should they create, I mean, you see a lot of like checklists or eBooks, like how can somebody start to, to build that list? Okay. So I really do believe now I'm biased, but I believe that if you want to do something and do something right, find somebody else who's gone before you that is willing to teach you step-by-step how you've done it. And whether that they're going to teach you for free or paid, you got to find a guide. I mean, I learned this from my Tony Robbins days. He always says like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Everything's already been done before. Go find someone who's gone before you and figure out exactly how they've done it. So I'm a believer in that. And obviously I teach list building. If you don't learn from me, learn from someone else. But on my podcast, Online Marketing Made Easy, I have tons of free resources about growing an email list. But it's important that you actually get going and taking action means signing up for an email list building service. So convert kit is my favorite. It's free to start. So get in a software that will allow you to legally collect names and emails and send out emails. And number two, you've got to get a lead magnet together, a cheat sheet, a checklist, a guide, a free mini course, whatever you want to do, but something so valuable that people will give up a hot commodity, their name and email in exchange for that. So the software and the lead magnet are essential. Love it. So I think that I would guess the next phase of this is figuring out a way to connect with your audience, right? Like once you have, I've started to build an audience, once you've figured out like what it is you want to sell and who you want to sell to, like it's about connecting and making sure that you can build a relationship with your audience, either through storytelling or just through constant communication, you know, by these different channels to be able to get people to, you know, buy whatever it is that you're eventually going to, going to sell. Like what are some of your best practices for, connecting with your audience, whether it's on social media, whether it's on your email list, or even like when you're out at a net, at a networking event. So the first thing I got to back up a little bit, I teach my students that we all should be creating weekly consistent content. Now I say that and only a chosen few will actually do it, but I promise you those that will do it are going to make a bigger impact in their business. So that means what you and I are doing right now, a weekly podcast or a weekly video show or a blog, a weekly blog. But I really do believe anybody who's doing business online should be creating weekly original content for two reasons. Number one, you're gonna cast a bigger net. You and I both have podcasts. That means people are finding us organically every single week because we've been doing this for a while and now we're getting pushed out in Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all of that. So I love the idea of having weekly content to cast a bigger net and to grow an audience. 
but you also already have an audience. So to nurture the audience, to be their go-to source, you got to show up for them every week. And you do that through a podcast or a video or a blog each week to say, here I am. I'm here for you. I'm offering value every week. I'm not going anywhere. That builds the no like, and trust factor. When you're ready to sell something, they're ready to buy. So that's a big one right there. I think another thing is video. When Facebook Live first came out many, many, many years ago, I said a really silent prayer, please let it fail. Please don't let this work. I didn't want to do more video. I was really self-conscious about it and I didn't like how I sounded or how I looked on video and I just didn't want to do it. But that competitive part of me thought, well, I'm going to get past Oh, behind, like I'm going to be pushed behind and my competitors will gladly step in with their videos. So if you want it bad enough, I'm going to tell you right now, you got to do video. I think you have to embrace it, figure out, do it on your terms, but you don't have to look a certain way or sound a certain way to be able to make an impact and make money online with video. So embracing video would be another one that I think is necessary. It's so important. And a lot of people like struggle with getting on camera because you know, like, like you kind of alluded to, they don't like the way they look. They don't like the way they sound. They might not like the way they look in a certain outfit or where their background or whatever the, the case may be. And you've struggled with this personally. You, you've talked about this several times on the show so far. Like what have been some of the things that have really helped you other than that competitive edge? Like maybe it's something that you've said to yourself. Maybe it's like some sort of journaling exercise. Like what have been a few of the things that have helped you get on video, be somewhat comfortable on camera, even though you were scared as heck to do it? I got some advice uh, many years ago where I was really nervous to get on stage. So video stage, whatever it might be. And the guy that was hosting the event, he said, you're only nervous because you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about how you're going to look, how you're going to sound, if you're going to do a good job. But if you focused on the audience, just loving them up, giving value, making it about them and not about you, those nerves will eventually subside. And he was absolutely right. When I got out of my head and stopped making it about me, 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 and started saying, okay, how can I change his life? What can I do for her? How can I help her? It's a whole different kind of energy. And so that's what I had to do. I had to stop being so self-conscious of me and start thinking, what, how can I add value to someone else? And it was just a simple mindset shift that changed everything for me. I do probably 15, 20 hours of video every single week now, where before it was never like that. So that's what I had to do. Wow. Good for you for making that, that transformation. And it's, you're so right. Like taking the attention off of yourself and like putting it on to other people and figuring out how you can help and serve, I think really can help people in anything that they're scared to do. You know, whether it's speaking on stage, whether it's starting a podcast, whether it's, you know, recording some content on social media. So thank you so much for, for pointing that out. And, and Amy, this has been amazing. Like I could spend so much time talking to you about all this stuff, whether it's what we discussed with your personal life and or your professional life. But I know for the sake of time, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm honoring our time here. So I think people are going to really want to like learn more about you, whether it's you know where to buy your book that's coming out, where to listen to your podcast, buy your courses, or connect with you on social media. So where can people uh, do that? Well, thanks so much for asking. So I have a podcast called Online Marketing Made Easy. And if you want to check out my book, Two Weeks Notice, you can go to twoweeksnoticebook.com. So thanks so much for asking. This has been really fun. This conversation was intense, meaning I typically just talk about list building and building businesses, but it's really fun to kind of get into the personal side. So thanks again. You're welcome. And I will make sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Amy said about her relationship with her dad. Maybe it was something that she said about building self-worth. Maybe it was something that she said about TikTok. Maybe it was something that she just recently shared about building a side hustle. Whatever it was, tag Amy, tag myself, because we'd love to hear your feedback. We once again thank you for listening to this episode of The Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and we'll see you next time.